Lounging Sun. Well, welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name's Ryan, and with me today I have Matthew Allison, who I just discovered your work this, I think it was like during the pandemic. Hancor was a fucking really dope book. It's one of my favorite books that came out last year. Thank you. Uh, oh, I'm really glad to be able to have you here to uh to talk comics, man. Welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah, dude. So yeah, like I said, like I just discovered your work. I'm sure you've been, you know, a cartoonist for a, more than just since I discovered you, you know? So I was wondering if, you know, you could share a little bit about yourself, about how you got, you know, how you started your, what started your love for comics and then how you turned that love for comics into something you wanted to do professionally. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think like most, most people that I've talked to that are, you know, that have a, a, an appreciation for the art form or consider themselves, you know, just a, a collector or a, a comic book reader. It, it goes back to when I was a kid. Um, my parents always bought me comic books. Anytime they, they would go to the grocery store, um, my dad read comic books. Um, you know, I was born in 73. So when I was a little kid, my dad had all the Warren magazines, Creepy and, and 1984 and Vampirella, all that stuff was out in the garage. So just something that's always been a part of my life. And then uh, when I was in junior high is when I really started getting into uh, um, collecting comics. Um, but it was always about the art for me. That was the 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 crux of my interest in it 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 wasn't so much about the continuity trying to figure out the history of these characters it just I just was always drawn to the to the artistic side of it mm -hmm. and because of that um, anything that I would draw in junior high and high school was sort of comic book related uh, the 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 style of drawing that I gravitated towards was traditional pen and ink that you would see in a comic book so. I've, I've never really um, tried to do anything else with my art other than make comic books. And I got sidetracked in my 20s, didn't do really much of anything with comics other than just drawing in my sketchbook. But uh, uh, it was about eight years ago I started doing um, my initial Kankor webcomic. Yeah. And just through that, just started self-publishing. And then the book that I believe you read, with the Ad House book that came out last year, that was my first collection of, of my own comics that came out um, from an actual publisher. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, I was blown away because I'm like, there's got to be more stuff that I can go get. When I finish the book, I'm like, there's got <laughs> like, there's no, this isn't this dude's first work, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, like I said, it totally blew me away. I think it's because of, how did I, it's because I started watching the, you know, the kayfabe channel, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. I, I had heard about it and I probably said this story multiple times with, on multiple interviews, but you know, like I helped Eli who is part of the, the Facebook group and I was helping him edit the wizard zine that they did. Mm -hmm. And I had heard of the of this of the YouTube channel, but like I I probably only seen like maybe a couple bits because of the Wizard magazine because I grew up with Wizard. So, yeah. but that's how I found out about your work, and I saw the art. And I'm like, dude, I gotta find it. And then like it was in the group, and then there was so many people in the group talking about it, like how good it was. So like I picked it up, and it's <laughs> it's 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 a crazy fucking book. You know what I mean? It really, it really is. So I was I want to know the idea behind it. Because it, it does seem like it's, and, and you talk about it in the notes in the back of the book too, like that some of it's mirroring life experiences as well. Mm -hmm. I wanted to, I just want to know more about what went into this book, the idea behind it, and how much of yourself you you were putting into it. Uh, you know, it's even the elements of it which seem super fantastical, surreal. You know, superheroes battling each other on this barren wasteland. There's always a bit of you know, my um, emotional state or mm -hmm. a reflection of an emotional state in that. Uh, you know, each each iteration of Kankor is some version of of you know what's going on in my head. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, at, at the core of the book, it's it's really about um, 
the frustration of trying to better yourself, trying to wake up each morning and say, okay, today I'm going to not do the things I did yesterday that sent me down the wrong path, whether that's drinking too much or wasting time watching movies when I could be drawing, all of that stuff. And, and you know, I, I mentioned earlier about not creating comics in my 20s. The setting of, of Kankor, at least in the autobiographical stuff, is that period of my life. So in the 1990s, I was working at a print shop. I was, uh, one of the things that we did there was we printed all of John Porcelino's King Cat comics. Mm -hmm. He lived in Denver at the time. So I was seeing him come in and, and print these comics and, and I was just blown away by what he was doing and, and the simplicity of his art, the fact that he was sharing these life stories. Um, and I wanted to do stuff like that, but at the same time, I was still locked into this idea of like, well, you gotta draw Batman. You gotta learn how to draw Wolverine. You've gotta, I was, you know, distancing myself from a lot of like the image stuff. And you mentioned Wizard Magazine. I hated all that stuff in the 90s. I, I had no interest in what was going on in, in the pages of Wizard because it all just seemed like junk to me. I was reading a lot of the comics journal, mm -hmm. uh, buying a lot of Fantagraphics books, drawing a quarterly. But in the back of my mind, I still always wanted to draw superhero comics. So when I started Kankor, it, it was a, a, a melding of all those different elements where it was like, you want to do these quiet simple autobiographical black and white comics but you also want to draw giant superheroes punching each other through walls and it just came together it was like well just do all of that just put all of that into one book don't worry about if it's going to alienate a certain segment of the potential audience because they're like oh i don't want to read about superheroes or somebody who only wants to read about superheroes is like, oh, I don't want to, you know, hear this guy's sob story about drinking too much or whatever. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I've developed a small audience that can appreciate the, the fact that I've, you know, mashed all that stuff into, into one piece. So um, that in and of itself is super satisfying uh, because I really enjoy making the comic because I, I have no limits in terms of what I can put into it. Um, and so that's been fantastic that I've been able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's why I love uh, creator owned stuff so much, you know, like, I mean, I, I said wizard, but the reason that I grew up with wizard is because like, I am just of that gen. Oh yeah. You know, and yeah, it's like, it. part of me is like, fuck, if I was only, like if I could have been just a few years younger, I probably could have got into some of the, like you said, like the fanographic stuff, I was late to the party, you know? Sure, yeah. Image launched when I was five, but that's like right around when I got into comics. Mm -hmm. Like five, between five and six, and, you know, I, I've never stopped. But, you know, once I discovered, like, I think Vertigo was my, I would say my first entry point into something not superhero. And then I'm just like, wow, this is what comics are. When I was like yep. a teenager, I'm like, this is so much better than anything I could have imagined, you know? Um, so like, yeah, like, I think of like Savage Dragon too. Like, look what Eric Larson did. He 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 got his not his start in superhero stuff, but he made his name there, right? Mm -hmm. And now he's doing his own thing. He does whatever the fuck he wants. Nobody's oh, telling yeah. him what he can or can't do. People can say they don't like a certain thing. He he pretty much gives you the finger. You know what I mean? He's like, I'm gonna do what I want. Yeah, yeah, that's but. yeah, that's super inspirational. And I um one of the things that I've learned recently, and the the cartoonist kayfabe guys have definitely leveled the playing field in terms of saying, you can like all this stuff. And it's not like you need somebody to tell you that, but right. they really exploded that idea of you can sit down and appreciate, uh, you know, Stephen Platt's profit work. Or you can sit down and read, um, you know, Julie Doucette's Dirty Plot. And, and it's, it's all comics. It's all whatever is, is working for you in that moment is great. And I, you know, part of the reason why I was so repelled at the moment uh, with the, the wizard stuff and the image stuff was that I was working in a comic book shop when all that stuff came out. Yeah. And I was uh 17 18 years old so my mind was moving in a different direction 
And I'm watching kids who were not that much younger than me, but, you know, 12 year old kids who are coming in and they're going nuts over Rob Liefeld. And, and I'm, I'm looking at it thinking like, well, this guy's just swiping from Frank Miller. He's, you know, he's blatantly stealing from these other artists and, and he can't draw certain things well. And all the things you, you think about with Rob Liefeld that, that people criticize, I was feeling all of that and very frustrated with it. Now I look back at it and I think regardless of what the, the you know, the arguable quality was to, to his work, he had a true passion for what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He loved comic books as much as I did or more so because he dedicated his life to it. Right. And regardless of how image affected the industry and, and the implosion that happened around that and the speculator market, you know, that's all the business part of it. But in terms of just a person wanting to make comics and that's what they've dedicated themselves to do, that's completely admirable. So now I look at those guys and look at McFarlane and, and Jim Lee and think, you know, that was just what they were doing and what they loved doing. And, and you can't fault them for the fact that it became super popular with a certain segment of comics readers. Mm -hmm. That's just the nature of it. So, yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, you know, you're mentioning Rob Liefeld, you know, like, and yes, that dude's gotten more criticism than I can really point at for like another creative. I don't think there's another one that's been like publicly I think oh, yeah. shamed it would be the right thing. Like Wizard yeah. Magazine was like attacking him, you know, attacking the person, attacking him as a creator. Um, but yeah, his passion is, I mean, he exudes it. Like his his podcast is probably one of my favorite podcasts to listen to right now. Like him going through like his experiences in the industry, like who he's dealt with in comics. It's just, it's a really interesting look at the industry. And like, you know, I work at a shop now. So I'm seeing... I'm seeing the the mirror of the 90s happen yeah. again. You know, the speculators have found a new a new uh, generation of things to fucking pick at. And it's like, yeah. you know, part of it, I think like I'm, I feel kind of how you were explaining how you felt. You know, maybe not so much in terms of like, you know, the, the comics, right? But like just these people coming into the shop and what's hot? And mm -hmm. I'm... What fucking kind of question is that, man? What do you mean? What's hot? What what is that? Mean? He's like, well, what's good right now? I'm like, well, do you want a quality book, like, or do you want something that just sells out? Like, what kind of book are you looking for, dude? You know, yeah. I find myself getting so frustrated to where when I first started at the shop, I'd be a little bit more understanding, and now I'm just like, oh yeah, you know, like I just don't have patience for you, dude. I I could recommend you a lot of good comics, but I'm not gonna point you in the direction of a book that's worth money or that I think is going to get you money. You know, like that's not what comics are to me. Comics are, they bring me joy. You know, that's why I have a YouTube channel because I'm passionate about comics. I can't, I don't make them, but I love talking to creators such as yourself. And I love talking comics, talking about the different ones I read, sharing that love with other people is what made comics special to me, you know, and like not giving you the first appearance of some new character that may not mean shit six months from now. Sure. Yeah. And that element, I mean, that's always been there. And, um, but for, I, yeah, I'll say that like, if, if, if you want to make comic books, your life in terms of creating them, don't ever get a job in a comic book store. Cause it's just going to frustrate you on a daily yeah. basis. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, uh, you know, I don't read a lot of, of, well, I don't read a lot of comics in general. Um, like I said earlier, I, I mainly, you know, interested in comic book art. Uh, but the stuff that I do read is stuff that's um, uh, a little more um, like slice of life type stuff. Like I'm going back and I'm rereading Chester Brown and Joe Matt. You know, his his peep show comics were an influence on me way back when. And so I'm going back and I'm reading that stuff again. And at the same time, I'm also reading a lot of the Frank Miller Sin City, which I never read when that was coming out. Uh, I think I bought the first collection uh, when that came out from Dark Horse, I think, initially. Right. Um, so, you know, and that's very simplistic storytelling. And that appeals to me more than reading page after page of just text of just characters explaining uh. all their motivations behind this, you know, major event <laughs> going on through all the Marvel comics and stuff. I, I can't get into that. 
Yeah. I never really was into it. You know, the first crossover I remember was the Secret Wars 2 mm-hmm. uh, event where that seeped its way into every single Marvel title. And as at the time I was 14 or 15, I was like, man, this is gross. I don't, I don't <laughs> need to buy every single Marvel comic to figure out what the Beyonder is doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, it worked for them. It clearly created the template that they've been using for the past 30 years where it's just every year you get these events and you know oh, sometimes twice a year it, yeah it's yeah i i feel you on that the crossover thing is something that especially now that i have to deal with pulling books for people and they sign up for all tie-ins and i'm like dude i am yeah. like, i'm judging you guys as i'm pulling your fucking books that you're getting <laughs> 50 fucking comics for one story like that's yeah. that's insane but i want to talk about too like uh so how did you go from doing the web comic? How'd you hook up with Chris Pitzer from Ad House to get this collection made? Did he reach out to you? Did you guys meet at a con? How'd that happen? Yeah, we actually, uh, we had met, I believe, at a Heroes convention one year. Just, you know, him coming by the table and picking up some comics. And then we'd see each other at conventions. And uh, the first time we had a real conversation about the potential for Ad House doing the book was at um, TCAF. I want to say 2018, 2017. Um, And at the time, the only publisher I'd really talked to about it was Fantagraphics. And I didn't, the book wasn't even completed at that point. I was just in the midst of the self-published single issues. And, you know, I, I told Chris that I was talking to them about it, but ad house always felt like a better fit um because i liked in particular i really liked the jim rug books that he had done and i knew that um if i was going to say well who's my audience i think jim's audience is pretty similar to to my own um Mm -hmm. who like splashy action comics but they have an indie bent to their sensibilities and you know fanographics is definitely way more on the indie side and so as in terms of it having any sort of superhero element to it i just didn't i I felt like i'd have to really push it on fanographics for them to be interested in it whereas chris just based on what he you know had published with jim i felt like oh you know that's going to be a uh a better fit in that regard so you know that just got the ball rolling and um he actually lives in in uh, virginia near my mother-in-law so i you know would see him anytime we'd go out to to visit my mother-in-law and just you know go get lunch and talk comics and stuff so just in terms of a, a personality match chris and i are pretty simpatico in that regard so it just felt like yeah this is a person who's going to really um, understand what I want to do and uh, is super open to anything that I suggested and and the suggestions that he made as far as putting the collection together I was on board with and it just worked out really great and you know I forgot to ask too like when I was asking you about you know putting yourself into in your own experiences into this story Mm -hmm. um, you put the serenity prayer in there yeah. And I, I mean, I'm not saying that you're in the program or anything, but like I am in recovery. So that like really, really stood out. And I think that's like what really resonated with me too and watching like the struggle throughout the book. So I was wondering why, why did you put the serenity prayer in there? What was, what was that about? Um, so I was in the program. I was in AA uh, right before I started doing my web comic. Um, my drinking had gotten way out of hand and it was, you know, putting me on a really dark path and, you know, through, you know, some suggestions made by my wife, it was like, you got to, you know, do something to, to help you out. And the reason why I was drinking is because I, you know, didn't have a proper mental health diagnosis. And I was really depressed about working at a, at a job that I hated when I really wanted to be making art for a living and I, I wasn't capable of doing that. So the drinking just filled in that void. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm 
an atheist. I I am not someone who necessarily um, subscribes to any uh, religious belief at all. So going into AA, that is part of it. They say that it's not, but it is definitely part of it. Yeah. But the serenity prayer, you know, you can take that and apply it to your life, regardless of whether you're religious or not. And the essence of, of what's in those words um, is, is pretty true to the core of the book. And just saying, like, there are things that are out of your control. And the, the more you try to control those things, the more frustrated you're going to get. And at some point, you just got to let it go and realize that, you know, I'm not saying that some divine hand of God is going to come and guide you, but there are paths that you can take that you should be taking. And if you keep resisting that, you're, you're just going to be banging your head against the wall. So on a personal level, that was me with comics of just like, you, 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 you feel like you need to make a certain type of comic and you, you just are trying to force a, a square peg into a round hole. But what you should do is just let it flow and let it happen natural and don't fight it and just allow uh, whatever happens on the page to happen. I was never happy with my art. I was completely dissatisfied with my style. I just felt like I was a shitty artist and nothing I did looked right. And so putting that first web comic out was me just saying, I know that this isn't exactly what I want it to be. I know that the art isn't as polished as I'd like it to be. My coloring skills aren't that great. I just have to let it go and, and accept the fact that those are, that's just the way I draw right now. Mm. Like, I could have gone to school. I could have gotten better at comics, but I didn't. And so I just have to allow this to be what it is. So that's, that's a big part of why that, that um that prayer was in there yeah i mean i like i said i i liked seeing it because i being in the i haven't i mean i haven't gone for quite a while especially because of the pandemic but that that program saved my life because like i was i was doing a lot harder of stuff than just drinking you know what i mean so and so when i can see these like little hints at recovery or stuff associated with it those stories always really seem to sit with me. Like mm -hmm. my action, uh, he had done uh, Iron Man run, and he yeah. did a lot with Tony Stark's, like, you know, about alcoholism and talks about the program. So you can tell when it's like a genuine knowledge of something uh, to do with the program or when they just see it in TV or they just, like, kind of know and, like, and I'm like, yeah. oh, it's not real. So that's why I wanted to just ask you. You know, I thought that was yeah. interesting you put that there. So going from the webcomic to print, what, how did you, like, what was the response? How was it different um, as opposed to, like, what you were seeing in terms of, like, numbers of fans, like, with that? And did it, like, did it not only translate from the webcomic to the print version, but did it expand a lot more? Well, you know, I always wanted to print it just because I do like physical media. The The fact that I was doing the webcomic was just a matter of ease because I just, you know, just... Yeah put it up every week and, and, you know, you don't have to worry about mailing anything and any of that stuff. But because I was working at a print shop, it made total sense for me to actually print the book. And um, I got a really good response when I told people that I was doing that, you know, I, at the time my blog had maybe a hundred followers and the majority of those people said, yeah, send me one of those books and, you know, I'll PayPal you. And, I, I knew then and there that it was like, okay, this seems feasible that, I mean, even if I only print 200, that's plenty, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to break into the industry. I'm not trying to get an image contract. I'm not trying to, you know, sell this to a, a movie studio. It was just about like, Hey, I've got a core audience here that follows my blog and, and they're interested in buying this. And I started doing conventions at that point too. And, uh, you know, just it, it felt like I could, I could build this to a, a reasonable living. Um, people were also interested in buying my original pages. And that was very satisfying to know that somebody actually, you know, wanted the original art as well. And, um, you know, this past year, I, I signed up with an art rep. And 
I just moved to Chicago two years ago and I've just been doing art, making comics and doing commissions for the past two years and it's worked out perfectly. So um, that, that whole transition from working a day job and just doing comics on the side happened gradually and fairly naturally. And um, I, you know, I've got a, an audience of a few thousand people that really dig what I'm doing and, and I couldn't ask for more than that. So it's, it's been great. I like, I love your style. I instantly, like, I was, I, like I said, I was, I was really blown away. And I, I'm, I'm curious. Cause like, I can't pick out specific artistic influences from your style. I think like you're very unique in terms of like what you're putting from pen to paper, pencil, mm -hmm. but who artistically really do you draw from when, when, uh, when you were developing your style? It's not so much the, um, I think sometimes what I what I try to do if I'm asked that question is figure out like who has the same uh, feathering technique or who draws faces similar to the way and and I've never I've, I've purposefully tried to avoid making my art look like any particular artist and I've mm -hmm. I've never really sat down and attempted to copy someone's style uh, which probably would have helped me if I had done that if I had tried you know, figuring out like how to draw like, you know, Bernie Wrightson or whoever. But, um, you know, the biggest influence for me as far as just making comics was Dan Klaus and mm -hmm. Eight Ball. Uh, because even though, well, I mean, he did do superhero comics. He did the Ray or Death Ray. Uh, you know, D Dan Klaus was somebody who showed me that you can do any style you want to do. And you could do the most simplistic comic that looks like a Richie Rich comic, or you could do some highly detailed, fully rendered piece all within the same issue. And there are no limits and no, uh, um, there's no end to the, uh, the type of work that you want to put in there. So just in, in, in terms of pure cartooning and the specific type of comic that I want to make, Dan Klaus is up there. And then Jim Woodring, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of putting your mental, he, well, he's very spiritual. I don't consider myself to be a spiritual person, but I, I do try to channel his ability to uh, take his spiritual being and put it on the page. Uh, I look at things in a more psychological way where it's like, okay, I'm going to take this element of my you know, personal psychological diagnosis and put it on the page. Whereas I think Woodring is more about what spiritual element am I putting on the page? Uh, but regardless of, of, you know, what the, uh, the intent is in terms of, of whether you're taking spiritual or psychological, just knowing that you could do that with a comic, as opposed to just telling a story, say, I want to delve deeper into the idea of, you know, depression or anxiety and, and figure out how I can make these characters represent those ideas without just having them talk to each other about it. Cause I could sit down and just make a comic about recovery and a comic about uh, my experiences with therapy and all of that. You know, going back to the idea of <clears throat> liking comic book art, I want the art to tell that story. I want the visuals to tell that story. And um, you know, hopefully people can glean what I'm attempting to do there just through the visuals. Cause that's, I mean, Woodring stuff is all word wordless. So it's all about just watching characters interact with each other and understanding, well, this person, this character is angry because they're incredibly envious of the life that this other character is leading. And you can see that just in this expression that they're giving in this one panel. That's important to me to be able to tell that, that story visually and, and say, this is why this person is reacting this way. Right. And it also allows for, allows readers to uh, get a different experience when you're not just being like, just straightforward. This is what this, mm -hmm. is. like, everybody can pull something different from it. Like, maybe not everybody pulled that, uh, that quote for the, I mean, the prayer, you know, not everybody would know exactly what it is. And then there are the people like myself. Mm -hmm that can and and that's how you I think that's why 
I, I, I like this project so much because it is so many different things and you can pull so many different aspects from it. And it's, it's a really cool project. I do want to know, uh, do you have any more Cancor in the works or are there any other projects that you're currently working on that you can kind of talk about? Yeah, I am. I'm working on a new Cancor book right now. Um, <clears throat> it is, uh, the title is Body Needs, Bodies Need Rest. And it's essentially, it's a carry through of some of the ideas from the, the ad house book in terms of uh, unfulfilled potential, um, the frustration that the, can cause in your life if you feel like you aren't doing the thing that you are passionate about, uh, but it's tied directly into the experience of working with other people, having a day job and being surrounded by people who uh, can drive you crazy at times because of their behavior, because of something as simple as them tapping on a desk. Uh, <laughs> I have this problem called misophonia, which is a noise sensitivity thing. And I try not to bring it up too much just because, <clears throat> excuse me, it sounds a little phony baloney. It's probably driving people crazy listening to your podcast, hearing me clear my throat because somebody with misophonia, that would, would, <laughs> would make them nuts. But <laughs> Um, you know, specifically with this story, I'm dealing with a person who is just continually tapping on things twice and it just elevates the, the, the anger inside Kankor's head as this is happening. But then it ties into, uh, something that I learned in mindfulness classes, which is whatever you're angry about in that moment, that's being triggered by this noise probably isn't the noise. In fact, it's definitely not the noise. It's something else that you've got going on, something that you thought about when you woke up that day or something that happened to you a week before that you didn't resolve. So, you know, there's going to be an autobiographical element in there of something that I didn't resolve that's being triggered by these noises. So that that's the, the crux of what this new book is gonna be about. It'll be 28 pages, full color with some black and white sections. But, um, you know, it definitely ties into, you know, themes and, and elements that, that you saw in the, in the Kankor book. Awesome, man. And is that also coming out for Madhouse? No, I'll be self-publishing that. Awesome. So we'll get, you can get that from directly from your, your website then? Yeah, kankorcomic.com. Uh, and sure. uh, if anybody follows me on Instagram, I'll be, you know, putting up notices as soon as that's available. Right now, anybody who subscribes to my Patreon page is going to get a copy of it. Um, I'm toying with the idea of doing a variant cover just for uh, Patreon subscribers. But uh, <clears throat> after the Patreon subscribers get it, I will have it up for sale on my website. And there'll be some stores. I have some stores that I partner with, um, like Arcane Comics in uh, Seattle, uh, Quimby's here in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, so it'll be available through my website or through different shops, probably in June, I'm hoping. Oh, cool. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely going to be on lookout for that. Uh, is it, so is that all that's keeping you busy for, for now? It's just working on that or anything else you got coming up? Uh, that and commissions. So okay. I, my art rep has been keeping me super busy with doing commissions. A lot of what I do is uh, what we're calling cankerized versions of classic, you know, Marvel and DC comic book covers. That's one of the options we give people. So you'll Let's get, um, you know, some old world's finest comic, but I've replaced Superman and Batman with, you know, their Kankor variations. And right now I'm working on an X-Men piece, it's Magneto, but the, the collector specifically said like, you know, do a Kankorized version of, of Magneto fighting the X-Men. So that's that's the main thing that's been keeping me busy and paying the bills but uh yeah i'd much rather you know be doing that than working at a print shop so i'm incredibly fortunate to to be able to do that yeah i mean that's that's awesome i mean that's the dream right uh, for all cartoonists any artists like to be able to do something that you're passionate about that you love doing and mm -hmm. to just maybe not be rich but just be able to kind of like live off that you know what yeah. I mean? just to live comfortably and not have to, as you said, work at a job you fucking hate, you know? Yeah, yeah. So that's awesome, dude. I'm very happy for you. That's very cool. 
Right. Um, also, so like you talked about, like you really like the physical stuff, right? Like physical items. And that's why you wanted to get this in print. Do you exclusively draw traditionally or do you also do um, digital when you're drawing? All the actual line work is done traditionally. Okay. And it's, there, there's a variety of reasons why I do that. Um, the main one being that I like to have a physical piece mm -hmm. and you know more so than the selling of the the books selling the original art brings in more money so just in terms of finances it makes sense to have a physical piece that i can sell but i just like looking at original art and i the last comic book i convention i went to was c2e2 right before the pandemic started and there was a uh, an art seller there who had just portfolio after portfolio of Jack Kirby art. And I just sat there for an hour at this guy's table looking at all the Jack Kirby art. So that to me, I just always want, I want a physical piece mm -hmm. to look at and to have in collector's hands. And um, so that's important. And then the second part of it is I'm just too lazy to figure out how to, I have a tablet, I've got, you know, a stylus and everything. I've just never actually sat down and tried to figure out how to utilize that um, medium. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, the the coloring is all done in Photoshop, so the coloring and the lettering is is computerized because it's just way quicker to right here. But uh, yeah, just pen and ink mainly. Before we get out of here, I I, I want to ask you using your using your work kind of like I wouldn't say it's like therapeutic, but like being able to put some sort of autobiographical stuff in there. What is what is the most gratifying thing? of about being an artist for you i mean honestly you know your your reaction that you gave me is is you know uh the the greatest thing i could ask for in terms of just connecting with any element of it even if it's somebody just says man i love the cover of this book that that in and of itself because i i know what it's like to walk into a comic book shop and you've got hundreds if not thousands of brand new comics coming out every week and so for for something that i've done to stick out out of all of that and, and resonate with somebody is is super gratifying and you know i've i've been at conventions um this, this is something that happened very early on and it, it sticks with me because it, it it let me know that i was doing what i should be doing uh I was at the first Denver Comic Con back in 2012. I had just printed my first book and I watched this family come up. It was uh, mom and dad and their daughter who, you know, seemed like she was, you know, maybe preteen. She picked up the book, flipped through it page by page, and then she turned to her parents. She's like, I want this book. And just the fact, you know, watching her as she read it and looked at the pages and then that was the thing that she wanted to buy in that moment. I, you know, it's, it's one thing for somebody to walk up to your table, like, oh, this looks cool, but I could tell that she was having a connection with it. And then years later, I was at another convention in, in Denver, and she walked up to the table, you know, she's like four or five years older, but I just, I could tell by the look on her face as she was looking at my stuff that she recognized it. And she asked me, she's like, were you at the Denver Comic Con in 2012? And I said, yeah. And I said, I think I remember you. And she said, yeah, I bought this book from you and I look at it all the time. It's, it's the craziest thing. I, I don't know why. I just, I've always really loved that book and I'm really glad that you're still making comics. So just to know that this person bought that book for me and then four or five years later, that was something that they still read and still looked at. That was, that's all you could ask for is that somebody you know, didn't just throw it in a pile and forget about it. It was something that they continued to look at. So that's, that's super important to me. Yeah. That's a cool story, man. Thank you for, uh, thank you for sharing that. Sure. What, what creators or books um, are like things that you would really love to uh, recommend to people, especially if they're fans of your work. And then after that, if you could give us all where we can find you online, and then I'm going to drop every single link for your Patreon, your, your site, all that. I'm going to drop it down in the comments. Okay. I mean, if I was just going to recommend, um, you know, somebody who wanted to get into more classic traditional uh, 
comic book art from the 70s um anything that Nestor Redondo worked on he's been a huge influence on it. going back to your earlier question I was still rattling in my brain like who am I who do I look to as as an inspiration for for just creating lines on paper and Nestor Redondo is somebody who is just was a master at inking um, his own artwork is fantastic. Um, one of the things that he worked on was um, the Swamp Thing run after uh, Bernie Wrightson left the book. So when Saga Swamp Thing, I, no, it was just Swamp Thing. Um, there's a short run of Nestor Redondo Swamp Thing books um, that came out that's really overlooked by people. You see a lot of reprints of this, the, the Alan Moore stuff and you see reprints of the Bernie Wrightson stuff, but as far as I know, there's no collection of the Nestor Redondo ones, but um, that's something I always rec uh, recommend to people. As far as, you know, somebody who might like Kankor, uh, probably is already familiar with this, but um, Michelle Fife's Copra is a book that just continues to amaze me. And he's just experimenting every single time he sits down to draw a page. It's just all exciting and it's, you know, again, somebody who's doing superhero work who I know on a personal level is also very much into the indie stuff and alternative comics. And he's he's an inspiration in terms of someone who's able to meld those two things. And, you know, he's he's shown that you don't have to just stick to one or the other. But um, yeah, if, if, if somebody likes Kankor and they haven't read Copra, definitely read Copra. And then... Just uh, real quick, if you could uh, share the, you know, patient, all that stuff where we could find you and uh, how we can uh, continue to support your work. Yeah, the Patreon, uh, let me just double check real quick. Um, my personal website is cankorcomic.com. Then my Patreon is just under Matthew Allison. Um, and basically what I've got on my Patreon right now is all of the stuff that is currently out of print although the, the ad house book is now out of print and that's not up there, but anything that I did with Kankor prior to that is up for any $5 subscriber. So you can read all the original stuff, the, the first mini comic that I did. And um, I did a story called Van Halen versus the clash that I've reprinted a few times, but that's out of print yep. there. And then I've got preview pages from this new book that I'm working on. Okay. And so the Patreon site is again, it's just under Matthew Allison and um, I'm on Instagram at at Kankor, C-A-N-K-O-R-R. And I have a Twitter account under Matthew G. Allison, but I stopped posting after the election. I just, I, I hate going on Twitter. So I just am like, I don't want to even deal with that. So um, I haven't posted anything on Twitter in a long time, but uh, but that's pretty much it in terms of All places right. to find me. All right, cool, man. Well, you know, again, thank you so much for taking time to chat with me. Um, it's been fun and it, very insightful too. I'm really glad I was able to kind of uh, get some of the questions out that I had about the book. Um, and I would love to, you know, love to do this with you again sometime if you're up. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, man. Well, thank you. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Cool. Thank you, Ryan.